<laughs> Thank you, everyone. So I'm going to do a quick sound check. Rebecca, can you hear me OK? Yep, you're good. All right, so Lil, uh, Rebecca, one of my committee members, Rebecca Moore, is on the cell phone. <laughs> um, and she's sharing the screen. I also want to take a moment, because I didn't know he's going to be here today, but Steve, Wave to everyone that doesn't know you. There will be a moment where I refer, a couple moments, I refer to Steve Paget throughout this. That's him. Um, and he actually made that background slide there and, and a couple other cool ones. OK, so we all know that the Earth has fallen ill. <laughs> there are a number of environmental problems, such as climate change, pollution, overpopulation, desertification, and deforestation, to name a few. Humans are a major cause of these problems. If we think of the environment as producing ecosystem services, so goods upon which our well-being depends, we can think of humans as being net consumers of ecosystem services. Essentially, that means that we take more than we give back. Therefore, policymakers are trying to come up with many different ways to correct this. Um, in other words, how do we change human behavior to take landscapes that might look like this and turn them into something that looks like this. Or farms that might look like this and turn them into something a little bit more like this. A major force in conservation policy today that's really risen to predominance in the last 30 years is market-based conservation. The idea behind market-based conservation is it's rooted in neoclassical economic theory and it looks at um, the problem with the environment is uh, something they call market failure. Essentially the idea is that the reason we have environmental problems is because they're external to our everyday market behavior. And so, for example, um, let's imagine that I have a landowner and I, a landowner has a, farm, uh, has a forest. <laughs> Follow with me. A landowner has a forest, and that this forest produces ecosystem services that are good for the community. Maybe it filters the water supply, provides fresh air, um, might house some biodiversity. Now, if this landowner, according to this theory, is not receiving some sort of monetary value for this forest, then they might not actually care a whole lot about this forest. And when they're looking to maximize their profits on their land, they might go ahead and cut that down. That's an example of what would be called market failure. So according to this theory, if you can direct market incentives um, using either price signals, which would be uh, taxes and subsidies, or create actually a market for these ecosystem services, such as in the case of carbon credit systems or wetland mitigation banking, then you can incorporate these ecosystem services into market decisions and you get the happy planet. The question is, does this work? <laughs> And whether, <laughs> forgot about this slide, <laughs> whether or not this works, this is an intentional caricature of human behavior. Um, whether or not this works has to do with how we understand human behavior and human value systems. If human behavior and value systems are innate and people are profit maximizing individuals, then setting the price right will affect the desired change in human behavior and happy world. However, um, if, <laughs> if values are culturally created um, and they're embedded in those cultures, then they actually vary a lot across our societies and we're not entirely sure how they're going to react to these market signals. So what I looked at, um, I looked at the efficiency, well, effectiveness of these market-based mechanisms and I did it through the lens of human values. So what I was trying to understand were human values within my study area and how these are relating to land use decisions and how they're also relating to the ability of these market-based mechanisms to engage with those values. So I'm gonna break this talk down into three parts. I'm gonna look at the effectiveness of two particular conservation mechanisms. So I'm gonna look at the effectiveness of nature tourism, the effectiveness of something called Payments for Environmental Services, um, which is a program that pays landowners directly to conserve forest on their land holdings. Um, and then I'm going to sum it up, hopefully, very neatly um, and talk about what we've learned and what that really means for market-based conservation in this context. Okay, <laughs> so uh, the study area is located in Costa Rica, which is within Central America. And within that, in the Pacific Central region, um, there is a biological corridor called the Bellbird Biological Corridor. 
And what this is, is it's part of a 37 um, corridor network, so there's 37 total within Costa Rica, that have the express purpose of promoting sustainable development, so well-being and sustaining of natural resources across these mixed-use re regions. They are not actually um, conservation areas, but they're mixed-use regions, um, and in doing so, provide connectivity of habitat. So it's actually part of a larger Mesoamerican biological corridor network, which would connect the, um, the habitat, in theory, um, all the way across Central America. So the three-wattled bellbird is our flagship species for this corridor, and it was chosen because it actually needs to be able to migrate between the highlands up here, which is, this is where there was a Monte Verde Cloud Forest Preserve, a very large protected area, and the mangrove coast. Um, so it's chosen as a flagship species, but there's a lot more um, objectives going on here. Within this corridor, the main focus of policy right now is to promote conservation through some hopeful market-based mechanisms, in particular payments for environmental services and nature tourism. They have a major role in the hopes for this corridor at present, um, although there are other things going on there. Um, and so to talk for a minute about tourism, tourism uh, began in the, really in the 1970s, but it took off in the 1980s, 1990s, 2000s. In Costa Rica, tourism is now the number one economic activity. Um, and it's located in a fairly small area here, up in this northern Monte Verde region, okay? And that'll become important later on. Throughout this, throughout, I didn't actually look at the entire corridor because I wanted to isolate the variability. I didn't want to look at too many people doing too many different things. So I tried to isolate it to similar things, and particularly looking at impacts of this tourism industry. So my study area is the smaller area in pink there. Um, it's a two kilometer uh, buffer around the road network. Um, and within this area, people participate in different livelihood activities. Uh, dairy farming is one that's particularly popper, popular in the middle and upper regions of, this, of my study area. Coffee farming is another, and again, that's in a high altitude um, crop. Cattle ranching is really all over the place, but it's mostly in the middle and lower re regions. Um, okay. So, in order to understand um, landowner values, I borrowed from a bunch of different methods. So I used mixed methods. Um, and I borrowed from uh, environmental economics and used something called a stated choice experiment. This is a non-market valuation method that's used to try to establish a price associated with um, ecosystem, certain ecosystem services or changes in those ecosystem services. And so um, I combined this with ethnography, um, which is common to anthropology. Um, so here you can see that I'm doing an interview with a bird and a man. Um, <laughs> and he is actually holding some of the choice experiment there. Uh, and these interviews were audio recorded, so then I analyzed the text from them. And I'm, I'm going to talk about text data throughout the, <laughs> throughout the time. Um, and then I also participated in activities on farms. So here they dressed me up in a suit and laughed at me and made me hold some bees. Um, here I'm actually traveling around. I have a GPS receiver on my neck. I was getting points to map these farms um, and in the process rounding up some cattle, which is slightly terrifying. Um, and so uh, overall I had 87 landowner interviews that came out of a random sample of 100 landowners. I was able to map 61 of those farms, and um, 80 of them were audio recorded. Okay, so, <coughs> Quint, you've probably seen this. Um, okay, so, this is uh, just to give you an idea of how Costa Rica markets its nature tourism industry. Within Costa Rica, um, tourism is really how Costa Rica has attempted to embrace the global economy, and it's become a key strategy that has been intertwined with the de-incentivization of agriculture. Um, and one can make the argument... Hey, Karen, I think you lost Rebecca. <coughs> totally lost Rebecca. Did she call back? Sorry. Good call. Thank you. Uh how, how long have you been gone? <laughs> like seconds. Okay, good. All right. <laughs> we got you back, right? Okay. Okay. 
So one can make the argument um, that most tourism in Costa Rica has a nature focus because that's how the, co the country tries to market itself. In the area where I was working, I know, <laughs> in the area where I was working, however, it's very much the draw to the region. People go because of this major preserve that's there. So this is just a little moment of marketing. In the jungle, the city jungle, the human works tonight. In the jungle, the concrete jungle, it's becoming so uptight. <laughs> you got to get the two cans. Um, <laughs> So unfortunately, I can't play the whole video for you, but don't worry, uh, he does get saved. He gets to Costa Rica and everything turns all right for this American. Um, okay, so the question being, does this nature tourism promote sustainability? So this is a chapter that was co-authored with Steve Paget Vasquez, who is also in the ICON program, and his um, specialty is remote sensing. And so he looked at, he took two different images, one from 1986, one from 2014, um, that really got the span of the nature tourism and rise in Costa Rica. And he did a land cover classification, or quick forest cover classification on these um, by doing a wide dynamic range, range vegetation index, and then classifying those two, the study area over those two time periods into forest and non-forest properties or forest and non-forest. And then I took the landowner maps, I overlaid that, and I extracted the percent forest cover on those properties so that I could look at percent forest cover change. I used that as a dependent variable in um, a re regression analysis. And now I went into this really expecting to find variables um, related specifically to the tourism industry. So I um, went through the text data, I went through all kinds of demographic data and looked at things like working in tourism, um, specific income off of tourism, farm tourism, distance to Monteverde, and it turned out that none of those were actually significant in my ordinary least squared regression, which is how I established the significance of the variables. What I did find, however, was variables that I interpret to be related to <coughs> agricultural abandonment. So what you have here is distance from rivers. So places that are closer to rivers are differentially reforesting. And I'm going to use the word reforesting a little loosely for sake of speech. Um, age. So age, the older landowner was, the more forest cover they had regrowing on their property. And slope. So more variable terrains were reforesting. And, um, and also agriculture. So people who were continually working in agriculture and it was their only source of income had less forest on their property. So what these combined really speak to is a process of agricultural intensification and abandonment of marginal lands that's happening. Now this last one is payments for environmental services attitude. And payments for environmental services attitude means that people who liked payments for environmental services, which was a small subset of my population, had more forest cover on their property over these years. Um, this was a little bit surprising to me, given other stuff I'm going to talk about. So 42% of these people did not have any interest in the program. And when I went back to the text data to figure out what was going on, I had lots of quotes like this. Well, my neighbor who participates in the program earns money, but the most important part is that he is conserving. Selling oxygen, but also conserving the stream bank, and that benefits a ton of families that live downstream, which is something. So what I was really getting out of this is that people who liked payments for environmental services liked conservation. Um, and in thinking about the chicken and the egg question here, I think they really liked payments for environmental services because they were conserving. Because of the time difference here, payments for environmental services was not instituted until 1997. And I'm looking at this from the 80s. So then what I did is um, ran a geographically weighted regression and I gave those results back to Steve and he constructed interpolation maps. And what those do is essentially smooth out the results over the study area to allow us to look at some major trends. So this is the pred predicted forest regrowth um, across the study area. And red is just high, <laughs> blue is low. So in this case, we have high concentrations of forest regrowth and lower concentrations where with either zero or negative regrowth. Um, and this is just to show you that it was, as predicted, um, well distributed across the area. But when you look at the other variables, there's a clear north-south division. 
And this division kind of runs perfectly between where more of agriculture has been centered and where, um, and where the tourism is centered. And so in this lower study area, you have a lot more agricultural abandonment happening. And that's what is really driving these, these uh, land cover changes. In the northern area, you have an attitude that seems to be best related to forest regrowth. And so what I did after doing this is I went back to um, the text data and I looked through it to, to make sense of this formal model. And what I essentially built was a, a, a conceptual model like this, which says that, okay, tourism is related to forest cons conservation through the vehicle of money and we're getting more forest regrowth. However, I'm not necessarily sure that this is a win-win situation for sustainability right now because it's happening through this vehicle of farm abandonment that's causing some economic stress, possible economic stress on the region because it's, um, what has happened is people refer to the tourism industry as the golden goose or golden chicken of Costa Rica, which basically, um, so people were selling their farms and moving into tourism um, and then when tourism crashed, they didn't have anywhere to go. Uh, and so it's possibly creating actually some economic instability and some major changes in values occurring with that that I'm going to talk about a little bit more. Um, and then from tourism in its own right brings some not so good things with it that people talk about a lot. It brings debt, it brings theft, drug abuse is big. Um, and water pollution is another major one. So this is at the, the, the top of the watershed region and they're getting more water extraction to support this tourism industry. And they're also, um, there's no water treatment facility, so you're getting lots of water running into the streams. And that's causing suffering downstream. So you could look at this as we're actually having these ecosystem services that are not co-produced in this industry at current. Okay, so moving on, payments for environmental services. Is it effective to pay these landowners to conserve? Um, briefly, this program has been in effect since 1997. It pays um, landowners for these certain target environmental services or ecosystem services through the proxy of forest cover. The main focus of this program at present is forest cover. Um, there's several different ways. There's a little bit of talk of sustainable land uses, but the main focus is forest cover, particularly in the area where I work. So in the area where I work, it would be maybe forest cover near a stream bank, but it's still the idea is to conserve, to pay landowners to keep their forest intact and to not use them. So what I did, there's been some debate about how successful this program is, and a lot of the, pro, the, the debate revolves around whether or not we have the price right. Um, and there's some thoughts kind of known that no, they don't at current have the price right. So what I thought was, okay, I'm gonna design the state of choice experiment to look at what landowners want on their lands and compare, want out of a program, I should say, and compare that to what actually exists. And I thought by offering a bit more money, currently, commonly they get about $64 per hectare per year. I thought by offering up to $425, I'd be able to find the right price to cause this behavioral change. So what this is, is a carefully des designed series of questions. This is a choice situation that I would present them with. There were 12 total of these. And I give a lengthy script <laughs> that describes um, a hypothetical scenario where you are going to imagine that you're taking part of your land and putting it in a payments for environmental services like program. Will you be paid for a certain percentage of that land for putting it under a certain use um, with a target environmental benefit um, per hectare per year. And so I would ask them, which of these do you prefer, A, B, or C? And then I give them another one, and they, the, what, the components of it very slightly. And then they would get another one. <laughs> and um, after they answer all of these questions, and I just want you to notice here that one of the alternatives is always um, the same. And this is, I prefer to maintain my current land use. Meaning, I prefer to do what I'm doing at present and not being involved with this type of program. This is called a status quo option. Now, sometimes you get people who chose the status quo for every single choice situation presented. In that case, we actually call it a protest response. And that term's gonna come up a lot. So the protest response, the idea behind that terminology is that they're protesting something possibly larger about the experiment and not the specific components of the alternative. Okay, so briefly, um, I began collecting data with my sample, and I started my work where I was living, which was in the Monterrey area. And I'm getting really great data, and people are really engaging with this choice experiment. 
and it seems like everything's working like I expected. <laughs> and then I start going to more and more places where the roads are terrifying to drive up um, and they're very remote areas. And I noticed people started responding quite differently. And I was started getting a lot of uh, protest responses and a lot more resistance to the idea behind payments for environmental services. So when I went into analysis, I had that in mind, that I needed to understand variability, not just what people liked, but how people were responding differently across the population. This is analyzed, a choice experiment is analyzed with a logistic regression. Essentially what it says is the probability that you chose one of your alternatives is influenced by the components of that alternative. <coughs> So I used a latent class list logistic regression, which basically allows you to look at possible subclasses um, within your population. And I divided these classes on, along this protest response. So I ended up having about 34% of my um, sample was a protest response. And so I, um, and I sensed that, that some people were kind of close to there. <laughs> Not all the way there, but kind of close. So I thought it was appropriate to create these classes um, conditioned on this protest response. So these are kind of forced into one class and people like them would be drawn into that class. So I rightly labeled that PES resistant. Um, and what I found is basically there was a group of people that didn't like it very much. And when they did like it, it was only because they were putting a tiny bit of land in for as much, possible, much money as possible. However, there was a PES did that do twice? Yeah. However, there was a PES accepting group that seemed to really engage with the idea of the program. They seemed to like it. Um, and what they liked most about it was the ability to um, maintain some sort of agricultural production on the land. So these alternatives here of agroforestry, an example of that would be like shade grown coffee where you can combine agricultural and forest. Um, or organic agriculture. So I had positive um, preferences for those two facets. Um, and there was also a lot of interest in this would be this signified the water quality ecosystem service so people were more interested in protecting the water in the region the other alternative was forest and yes those things are linked um, okay so one thing I want to point out about this up front is that there was a negative preference associated with the no permitted use category which is how it most commonly exists in the zone you fence off your land and you're not allowed to use it um, people didn't like this <laughs> and they didn't like that about the program and despite paying them over eight times uh, the current payment um, they still I was not eliciting a preference a behavior even a hypothetical behavior change for this program so what this leads, led me to believe at this point is it wasn't just we have the price wrong something more is going on here so I looked at the difference and how protest respondents actually answered the choice experiment questions and I compared that to everybody else. Um, and I found that when protest respondents talked about the choice experiment, they were using terms like self-reliance and agricultural production, saying that, that if I were to be in a program like that, I would lose my sense of autonomy. <coughs> um, and conservation ethics, so there was a lot of talk about that's not the right way to get people to conserve. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, people who participate in the program or who in the hypothetical program tended to like the idea of getting additional income. So often that was something like, yeah, I've got forest, why not do this? <laughs> I'll get a little bit extra money and I'm doing that anyway. Now that is actually not the purpose of the program. The idea, well, <laughs> in theory, the idea behind the market-based mechanism is to change the behavior. Um, and so uh, that falls into this category here that's called lack of additionality. So what this is doing here, I just wanted to give you the term, but now I'm going to explain. What this, this final graph of this section is on is showing you what people think about the actual program that exists. So remember, everything I showed you up to this point was about the hypothetical program. But I wanted to compare that to what do you actually think of payments for environmental services. Well, first of all, when I asked people about it, a lot of people didn't know what it was until I said, venta de oxígeno. <laughs> selling oxygen. <laughs> and once they knew of it as selling oxygen, everyone knew what it was. Oh, okay. It's alquiler, it's the renting to the government and you're selling oxygen. Um, and only 25% of people liked that. And I explained to you what those people were thinking. 75% of people thought it was a bad idea. The number one reason they didn't like it, it was because of the government. They believed that it was a way that the government might um, 
be getting rich at their expense, uh, undermining their authority on their lands, and possibly ultimately stealing their lands. Um, and then this other category here, which is lack of additionality, is people basically said, eh, I mean, it's fine if you've got a bunch of land you're not using. But again, the idea is to change their behavior. Um, and so it's it, not to necessarily subsidize something they might do in the absence of payment. Um, and then these other categories mirror similar things um, that I'm not going to go through entirely. OK, so, so far, nature tourism, Mm, not so much doing promoting sustainability completely. Payments for environmental services seems to not be entirely effective. Um, so the question then is, okay, what does this mean about market-based conservation? What have I learned about people's values, and what does this mean about our ability to use market-based conservation as a tool? And to get into that question, I want to go back to the difference between these protest responses and everyone else. So here I have two excerpts of text that actually compare a protest response <laughs> with someone who really seemed engaged with a choice experiment. So someone who engaged with a choice experiment said, this alternative is interesting. About 25% of my land, maybe a little less. I mean, it would be neat to get money for protecting the environment. Well, I'm already doing that. Nobody's paying me anything. OK, so there's a kind of a rational, calculating response to this answer. Let's compare that. And Rational, I mean economically. Um, let's compare that to um, this protest respondent. This protest respondent said, look, you probably notice I don't really want anything to do with PES because I feel like the right way to get us to have forest on property isn't by paying for this for the forest. It's by making us aware that the forest is necessary. Okay, so here we're not actually protesting. We're protesting the entire thing. I just don't like that idea altogether. And as I said before, I noticed that these, these people were kind of grouped together. <laughs> Lo and behold, there was some sort of culture of this protest response. So I ran another regression. And I ran a logistic regression looking at the probability that you chose a protest response as a function of certain de demographic characteristics. And I tried to see what characteristics best fit. Well, what I found is a fairly obvious one. If you are earning income solely on your farm, then you tended to protest right, because you didn't want to give up your ability to produce. However, these other three, I'm going to make the argument that it's part of a latent cultural variable. Um, so here you have high school education. And I found that people who did not have a high school education at minimum tended to protest the choice experiment. And this did not seem to, I looked at comprehension, it did not seem to be only rooted, uh, linked to comprehension, but rather to an, ab an ability to reduce conservation and ecosystem services to a monetary value and trade that off to other alternatives, which is a little bit different. <laughs> um, and so, for example, I'm going to give you a quote to kind of illustrate this. In one of my focus groups at the end, a highly educated individual, we were talking about um, sustainable development and problems in the zone. And when a highly edu educated individual steps up and he says, I want to hear about this stuff from the older, from the older, I want to hear about this from the older people here because I come from the university system where it's all about production, cost effectiveness, and money. And there needs to be a balance in other things as well. And so I think that quote kind of gets at how if you have a formal education, you might be trained in a little bit different way of thinking about things. And age was a big component of that as well, um, also independent of uh, education, which I think speaks to some of the cultural changes that we've seen in the region. Um, and finally, this region variable. So this was people living in market centers, not necessarily where your farm was. And if you lived in either Monteverde or another market center that was close to the Pan American Highway called Sardinal, then you were more likely to engage with the choice experiment. You were less likely to protest. So essentially, people in the more rural areas that had a little bit more of a subsistence economy were protesting more. So, I told you that I believe that this was because of a cultural variable, so I looked at language as well to try to um, follow this thesis a little bit further. And what I did is I noticed when I was transcribing these interviews that some people used business terminology, and it kind of stood out. They talked about, uh, they talked about um, negocio, <laughs> businesses, marketing, um, production, and things like that in a different way. And so I flagged these people. And I looked at the probability that those people shared other characteristics that I was finding um, with the protest respondents. 
And essentially, people who were using business language were less likely to protest. So they were, um, they were more engaged with that choice experiment. They, were, they tended to um, be living in a market center, so they tended to live in one of these areas, and they tended to describe the choice experiment as cost effective, and that was one of the reasons that they engaged with it. Um, so what I'm seeing here and what I'm arguing is that the ability to think of conservation in um, economic terms and in really in these market terms was actually a learned ability and it was being reinforced by participation markets but not everyone shared that. Um, and to give you an illustration of that I have a quote from another focus group where a farmer was talking about the difference between um, this agricultural lifestyle and the tourism economy and he says Farmers might ask themselves if they stay on their land and don't dive into the next thing, am I being left behind? Maybe one farmer will say, no, I'm happy with what I'm doing. But when he goes out to buy something, he's entering an economy that isn't agricultural. So everything is more expensive. And so it speaks to the, the there, there's a training that's going on here um, and a different way of thinking about <laughs> how you're using your lands. And so um, what does this mean for conservation? <laughs> I'm going to argue that I think it's not particularly good for conservation because the business is a simplified way of thinking about your lands. And so what I did here is I just, this is a, actually, um, it's a mapping, a conceptual map of the different types of things people were talking about during interviews. And when people talked about a conservation ethic, which was one of the things people talked about, um, they had all these other things that they were talking about at the same time, like self-reliance, water, fire, forest values, reforestation, and God. When people talked about business ideas, they were really <laughs> only talking about other business ideas, such as payments for environmental service, like selling oxygen, um, changes in agricultural practices, expenses. Um, and what I believe is that business is ultimately a little bit more of a simplified concept in people's minds. And that this might be, sorry, I just wanted, she's still there. <laughs> and that this might be problematic when we're thinking about sustaining ecosystems over a long period of time. So I have two anecdotes here to contrast different ways of looking at the environment. On the left, what you're looking at is a piece of land that was actually under protection in this Payments for Environmental Services program. Um, until the landowner found another more cost of, <laughs> you know where this is. <laughs> when the landowner found another more cost effective option and he sold the land and the new person didn't want, the, want to keep in the program, so what they did is they tried to clear the forest. Um, and when that didn't work out so well for them, they just lit a match to it and burned it. And they burned 200 hectares of secondary forest. And while this is a rather extreme case, I do think it's, it's suggestive of what can happen when you're asking your environment to compete with other prices on a global market. And so if you're training people to think of the environment that way, we need to be careful of what we're asking for. Um, so to give you an example, uh, this person took me out to see this, and he said, Oh, this is it, sorry, and he said, the government thinks that it is doing good, but what about the people who participate in PES? They're cutting down the forests. They're taking the money and destroying the forests, so I don't understand why they're spending the money. Now I'm gonna contrast that with, you know, <laughs> with this man over here, who was explaining to me what, how he feels about conservation. And um, he gave me a lengthy explanation about um, different interactions with people that have actually allowed him to see conservation differently over the years. And then he told me a, a somewhat melodramatic um, story about how one day he was watching the news. And on the news, uh, they started talking about how in a few, in a few years, there's not going to be any more trees and, uh, and we're not going to have enough oxygen. <laughs> and he says, I started watching that program. And I put down my, and I looked out the window, and I saw a guanacaste tree. That's a guanacaste tree. And I saw that every day the cattle on their way to their um, corral, I think that's the word, would trample it down, and at night it would stand back up again, pidiendo auxilio, begging for help. <laughs> um, he said, so I put down my coffee, I walked outside, I got a post, and I tied it to that post, and 35 years, it's there. 
and he took me out to see it. Now, while I recognize this is a little bit of a melodramatic story, I think it does <laughs> illustrate nicely the different complexity of values that gets people to conserve and that motivates behavior. And, um, and I, this complexity of values, I think, might bode better in the long run. Because with ecosystems, we're talking about not short-term market decisions, but long-term needs of, um, of the environment. <laughs> So to conclude, <laughs> um, to conclude, I actually asked landowners, um, some of them, <laughs> towards the end of interviews, what would you do if you wanted to save the world? What would you do if you wanted to make a difference in your community concerning environmental sustainability? And I got a lot of different suggestions. Um, they were usually along the lines of better reforestation programs that help train landowners. Um, a lot of the landowners would speak to me about wanting to reforest, but not necessarily even knowing what trees to, um, how to get the trees, or what trees to plant, um, particularly in the southern more corridor, <laughs> uh, because there's more active programs in the northern corridor. Um, environmental education, landowners seem to believe that uh, uh, that would have a good impact. And infrastructure support for things like organic agriculture. So um, allowing people to maybe change what they're doing in a more sustainable way and providing support to do that. Now there used to be, interestingly enough, a few more programs that were doing this in this region, but they tended to be defund defunded around the mid-90s, which was the same period of time when payments for environmental services were put into place. So I think it's important to remember that these funds are in direct competition <laughs> with each other. Um, but what came to me through the landowners was that uh, they really, what they ultimately wanted was to be valued by society for the work that they felt like they were doing. Um, and one quote to illustrate this is a person saying to me, the small farmer is the first conservationist because he has to leave something for his future. And this kind of change in conservation ethic used to be the major focus of conservation. And I believe that we need to, that market-based conservation at best needs to play a little bit more of a minor role in, in, in areas such as this. Um, and more emphasis needs to be placed on changing conservation ethic, which will be crucial for long-term sustainability. So I would like to thank a ton of people. Um, whew. Uh, so this was, as Ted said, this was funded by, uh, he already said all of that, um, but my, my committee members, so Ted is my advisor, um, Nate, Pete, Julie, Rebecca on the phone, <laughs> she's quiet, um, <laughs> uh, and everybody, Steve, who co-authored a chapter with me, all of the people in, um, in Costa Rica who worked with me on this project, particularly the landowners who opened their doors to me when they weren't entirely sure that whether or not I was um, a dangerous person. <laughs> um, and uh, finally, whew, I said it, I told everyone I was gonna cry today. Um, finally, my parents uh, who are there in the back, um, my husband, David, who's right there, and our children, Joshua and Kayla. So thank you all very much, and I'd love to take questions. Yes, Bram. Karen, I don't really have a very good question for you. I just didn't really want to disappoint you. Thank you. Asking the and you have to be the first question. So, <laughs> the question that's maybe not because this was this was really cool, and, and there was not a lot of loose ends to pull at. But the, um, uh, I mean, you've got some really good evidence here that 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 business logic, that rational choice logic, is is a very culture logic. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you sell that to the business community and the people in power? That's just they assume that's human nature. And how do you sell it to people to economists? Rebecca, I'm just kidding. Don't wait yet. <laughs> um, uh, that's a great question. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I think when I approach this, I can tell you how I, how I approach it and how I've been approaching it since the beginning. I will say I kind of sold it to myself. <laughs> Going into this, I was not thinking like this. Um, I was expecting a little bit more of the innate, uh, rational, profit-maximizing behavior. Um, so uh, 
what it amounts to is I think the ability to look at the problem from different angles and that's why with the chapter that really focuses on this I try to look at it at 10,000 different ways to really hammer home the point um, which is that you know if you look at it in a formal model this is what you're seeing if you look at it from my text data this is what you're seeing um, to really try to hammer home the point but I do think you have an important point which I talk about in my conclusion a bit Ultimately, sometimes people just want to see the world however they want to see it. And you can give them 10,000 things and they're not going to want to see it that way. Um, in which case, I think it's more small, slow, grassroots work is what it comes down to. I mean, if I, um, what I would like to see happen in this area is kind of work that Quint's doing. You know, more of that kind of work, which is the, uh, Reinforcing refor reforestation projects, um, really trying to provide better outreach that used to exist in the area and it doesn't. And um, those things do require money in a market economy. And I'm not denying that we are in, you know, you, you need to have money to help get the trees and provide this kind of infrastructure, but it's a different way of using that money. Is there culture, so that north south divide, and then the, um, I mean, is there, how deep and noticeable is this cultural divide between people who think in business logic and people who think in, um, in more, I don't know what you want to call it, traditional values? Can you see it in the landscape? In That's a great question. And um, how I can speak to it is in the end when I did my focus, well, focus group slash presented my results to the community. And what really amazed me was the ability of the people in Monteverde to see it. So Monteverde is the area that's undergone the most change in the last 40 years. It's gone from a rural dairy farming place to this booming tourism industry. I seem to have a knack to, for making landowners cry during interviews because I had a number of them um, crying to me about things they've seen their friends go through. That we think that all this money is a good thing, but actually so-and-so is suffering from drug addiction, so-and-so died of alcoholism, so-and-so, uh, the list goes on. And, um, and so it, w it really astounded me in Monteverde in particular and made me feel even more confident in my r interpretation of the extent to which people knew this. So when I had the hardest time talking about this, was with a very small group of very vocal conservationists doing that really are, are putting all their, they, they feel so good about PES and they want it to work. And um, having them see this was really hard. But try, get, when I talked about it with the landowners, they were just like, yeah. <laughs> so. Were any of your interviewees or focus groups with women? And if so, did their views differ? So I found that women tended to be, in general, and I didn't have a large enough sample of women. In general, in this region, most of the women, uh, most of the landowners were men. Um, and uh, so I didn't have a large enough sample to look at it. I mean, it's very small, the group of women for the interviews. But what I did tend to notice is they tended to be better at the <laughs> profit maximizing type of mentality, actually, um, which maybe doesn't surprise us. Uh, and. Um, uh, in the focus groups, women were participating, um, and I didn't notice a big difference in responses from men in the, in the group setting. So, but I was curious about that, and maybe area of future research. So you mentioned this north-south culture, but I'm, I'm curious about maybe more specific or localized culture among neighbors. I'm mm -hmm. if, how much connection or communication you saw either in your interviews or elsewhere, because even one of your quotes mentioned somebody's uh, positive perception of what their neighbor was doing. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering how that might influence a person's choice to support or resist. I think it definitely does. I think um, if people think, uh, so there's a lot in that question. I'm going to try to pull out different pieces um, and let me know if I don't answer all of it. But um, I do think, for example, that in that southern area, that one case study of what happened, um, it wasn't known about in a huge region, but the people who did know very close had a very negative idea of payments for environmental services because of that. And people who knew of this other one did seem to like it, although everyone knew that the reason he was ultimately doing it, he was never going to use that land no matter what. Um, uh, so, but there was definitely microcultures. There's definitely di little differences. Um, Really, I, I, I broke it into these major zones of Monteverde, um, Guasimal, and Sardinal, 
which you probably wouldn't remember all those, but um, uh, actually within Monteverde, there's a huge difference between the San Luis culture and the um, Santa Elena culture. Uh, San Luis is a more agrarian community, but it gets some subsidizing from the tourism industry. So people have very diversified um, livelihoods there. They were much more positive about tourism there than people living in Santa Elena. People in Santa Elena kind of just felt like, <laughs> um, and so, and, and actually in San Luis, I thought there were like, maybe the best you could possibly use market-based mechanisms is happening in this one community because there's lots of, you know, it, it's helping them in small ways, but they're thinking in the big picture. They're thinking about how do we create a more sustainable community? How do we support each other? It's, um, they have a community center where, uh, that they, at, at, where they, um, where they're trying to get all these kinds of programs running out of it. So, Yes, these communities are vastly different, um, and there's a lot more, and this is just kind of major trend stuff. Did that get at all the components? Yeah, just a comment, like, the reason I'm asking that is just the importance of interpersonal communication among peers. In yeah. A lot of your implications were maybe about eventual behavior change. And right. That sort of advances beyond just education mm -hmm. to a different level, and it sounds like you have the, the raw material to maybe make that happen with future programs down there because these, the, there are these tight connections. Right, right. And actually how tight those connections are depend on the community. Mm -hmm. But that's a whole, the, the more marketplace, market-based, I talk about this a little in my dissertation, but the more market-centered places actually didn't have a whole lot of social fabric anymore, if you will. <laughs> um, so those were harder, on some level, almost harder to do the work there. Did, oh, sorry, John? Back to the, uh, conceptual diagram slide. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, one of the things that sort of jumped out at me about this is that, and, and a couple of other things that you said, is this idea of command and control. And I'm assuming that has something to do with the government. <laughs> yeah, sorry, command and control is um, prescriptive policies. So, um, it kind of predates market based conservation. The idea is that you just tell people what to do. <laughs> right, and so, but there's no connection between, because I mean, the thing that you mentioned is, is that you see the business, I mean, if you just look at the number of connections and the number of pieces, you see the business, um, the business side has a lot fewer. There's no connection in people's minds between PES and prescriptive as sort of opposite sides of the same coin or anything like that. Mm. No, I mean, I, I didn't get that. <laughs> Uh, there was a connection between the government and payments for environmental services, right. but not in the same way. So this was literally people telling me, when the government tells us what to do, it works okay, <laughs> kind of thing. Um, in the sense of don't take away all the trees on your land. Now granted, people, people do also don't always follow these laws, and I, I would often, yeah, people, people, there's the law in Costa Rica, and then there's what people do. Um, but yet people seem to kind of respond well to these suggestions from the government. It was almost like this kind of thing, they seem to feel that the government did have their best interest in mind when it was connected to the conservation ethics stuff, but not when connected to payments for environmental services. And um, one, there's a very specific reason for this. So according to the law, if you have a certain size forest on your land, you cannot cut it down anymore. And yet these contracts are for a short period of time. And so what people are afraid of is that maybe I'll be involved in this program and then in the future I can't cut back down my forest if I need to use it in productive so production. So the government actually effectively becomes the owner of this land. And in the region, sadly, there is a history of the government or people who work for the government or people in power somehow getting titles that were not originally theirs. Um, and so there's a lot of distrust in that sense. Karen, this is really fascinating work. So that's a good job. I, um, I think it has lots of implications for market-based conservation globally. So my question, I guess I have a two-pronged question. One is, is there a way to get a pulse on Costa Rica and other countries and how <coughs> things are changing, right? Education, like a more market-based um, focus you know, is there a way to fill, fill out a country and how it's moving towards market-based capitalism or away from it? And um, yeah, I guess it, you know, there's some things called like Hofstede's cultural dimensions where you have like 
you know, country's more masculine or feminine or different power dynamics. Is there a way to like say, okay, this is what you should do for conservation if your country is more market-based versus more maybe non-economically focused? Um, that's where I like. I want to go with this. So thanks for asking that question. Um, so I do recognize this is limited to understanding Costa Rica, um, and I've Rebecca and I worked on a choice experiment here, and we saw some interesting variation across the population that I'd like to go back to and dive into a little bit more. Um, but what I really want to do is look at um, kind of trends here and see how different they are from what. I saw in Costa Rica and be able to kind of piece this together and understand, okay, so do, does market-based conservation actually work better in some places because of differences in culture and worse in other places? Um, and uh, yeah, I think there might be some interesting stuff there for, for future research, but at present, <laughs> this is what I've got. <laughs> do you know if Costa Rica is going more, do you feel like it's becoming more of a market-based economy or it's going away from that? Like, how would that? So Costa, <laughs> Costa Rica is in um, an interesting situation. I would call a precarious situation. Um, those who study Costa Rica or are from Costa Rica might have different opinions on that, although I know David's opinions. Um, uh, it has really gone quickly into a global economy. It signed the Central American Free Trade Agreement about eight years ago, nine, no, math, whoa, six years ago, I think. Um, and it's really just starting to go into more, um, coming into effect more. And so, so far we don't really know uh, whether or not we're seeing, you know, what, what's happening with this. But one major trend that seems to be mirroring things we've seen in the United States is income inequality. We're seeing some people, I, I, my jaw almost drops when I go to certain areas of the Central Valley like Escazú and the amount of money I see there. And I used to live pretty close to there in, in like 10 years. I mean, it's just, uh, and, and yet then you go to these other places like Punta Arenas and it's, it's almost like you're in entirely different countries. And um, one might make the argument that the cutting of uh, the protectionist measures that Costa Rica had in place in the 80s um, could have slowly led to where we are today. In, in, I think Costa Rica might be in a little bit of economically trouble right now. Um, a lot of the patterns I see make me nervous um, about how certain people's ability to make, meet their basic needs versus other people's ability. And then the amount of um, North Americans that have land there um, that have changed land prices, uh, locals can't really afford to buy. They're starting to get angry about it. And that's that's what I've started to notice is, is a little bit more, yeah, we're still pura vida, but we're really not sure how much longer we're gonna take this. Um, and I think the last election really kind of spoke to that. So hopefully um, everything will work out okay. <laughs> uh, and I do feel, I mean, I, I, I I've kind of in, in answering Bram's question, going back to that, I do feel like there is some, um, uh, communication that I need to do with this um, and did start to do when I was down there and will continue to do because um, I think maybe it's not, uh, there's a pendulum swing that's gone so far market-based and um, maybe we need to kind of pull things back a little bit. So, Quint? So that would be my question for you then is what's the alternative? What's <laughs> the alternative to the economic approach to drive conservation? What, what might that look like based on this is what I think it would look like. I think it would look like supporting grassroots movements, um, supporting, I think it would look like Bosques and Fincas on, sorry, Quinn's familiar. There's a program in the 1990s which was called Bosques and Fincas, and what it did was it was essentially, what is the word in forestry? Adaptive management. <laughs> it was essentially an adaptive management program that worked with landowners to figure out what they cared about on their farms and to help them create more sustainable farms. I didn't even know about this program going in. It wasn't on my radar, but the landowners spoke about it so much to me and actually feeling kind of sad about the fact that it just sort of disappeared. Um, UGA Costa Rica has tried to pick it up. Deb sort of picked it up with a different program, but ultimately the, the real, what they really liked the most about it, which was the outreach visiting the farms, has disappeared for them. Um, and I think things like that need to come back because the money's gone. So it's not that, again, it's not that money isn't important, but it's how that money is being directed. Um, and I think things like Bosques and Fincas 
It's been gone for almost 20 years and people are still talking about it. That's a lasting change. Um, and I think the organic agriculture movement in Costa Rica, I, I think it's hopeful. There's some cool stuff going on in organic agriculture. Everyone grows organically for themselves. <laughs> you know, and uh, in my interviews, like when they're eating it, they're going to grow it organically. And so uh, I think there's a lot of interest there and there's a lot that can be done with markets that aren't neoliberalism, globalization, you know, we have, that, that has to be the approach. So that's how I see the alternative. Um, and I want you to do it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Two o'clock. That's oh. a good place to stop, I okay. think. <sighs>